So we say for everyone that feels that we're disrupting their status quo tonight, we say that our status quo has been disrupted for 400 years. To everyone who says tonight that they have an emergency to go to, I say my people have been in a state of emergency for the last 400 years. Now we are not at a point for police reform. That day is over. The system cannot be reformed. We need a total fundamental transformation of the public safety system in the United States of America. And we say the people who have lived under this tyranny, the people who have lived under this oppression, we are the ones that need to design the new strategy. We are the ones that need to inform how our communities will be made safe. And we say we want the loved ones, the young men who because of the failure of the state to provide jobs and housing and employment and opportunity, let's bring young men and young women to the table to help design a 21st century public safety system that can actually deliver justice for the people. Welcome, 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 welcome. We want to say welcome to everyone. Welcome you back to the Bring the Heat virtual town hall. I am your neighborhood announcer, your friendly comrade from the streets, your brother in the struggle, Ben McBride. Some people call me Reverend Ben McBride. Some people call me Pastor Ben McBride. I'm just your brother in the struggle, Ben McBride. I'm coming to you live from Oakland, California. So glad that we got so many of us from across the country, literally from the West Coast to the East Coast, to the East Coast rocking from the South all the way up to the Northeast and everywhere in the Midwest. I see y'all shouting in. It's good to see everybody from all around. We got black folks, brown folks, white folks. We got Asian American folks, indigenous folks, our Arab relatives. We are all locking in here because we're committing ourselves to think about what does it mean for us to dismantle the police state in this country and really complete the journey that our black ancestors and relatives begun which was to get us towards abolition and freedom so that all of us are able to live free and live in a society where we all belong. So I'm thankful for your joining. This is session number two out of six sessions that we are having over the next five weeks. We started last week where we began the conversation around what does it mean for us to bring the heat, dismantle the police state and reconstruct and erect a public safety system that is worthy of us we know that this moment is not just about George Floyd, as, as painful as watching the death of our brother was. It's not just about Breonna Taylor, as painful as that is, considering those officers have still not been held accountable. This is a conversation about the 400 year old story of the devaluing of black bodies in this country. And what we want to say that until black lives matter, no lives matter. And when we can begin to change what is happening in this country, we are going to open up new tomorrows for everyone. So we welcome you. Thank you for being here in the virtual town hall. I want to I want to invite you to take a moment right now if you can. You can even do it while you're while you're right here. Some of y'all that were on last week, you might want to start a watch party for those who are watching on Facebook. We know that there's hundreds and hundreds of us in this Zoom room right now and some of us are watching this on Facebook or you're watching it on Twitter, on Periscope and and different channels, but if you're on Facebook, go ahead and start a watch party right now so you can invite your friends in and help them get their game up around this conversation of bringing heat. Today, we are going to be talking about the H for hiring. A little bit on the second half of our town hall, we're gonna be diving in to take apart this policing structure so that we can really get a stronger analysis about it. We're not going there yet, but there's a couple things that I just wanna put in front of you while we're on our way. First, what I want to say for us is we want you to get signed up for the movement. Go ahead and go back to the video on me. We're not yet at hiring. I'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the things that we want you to do is we want you to be able to get your game up. And so get your phone out and text the word HEAT to 40649. If you haven't done this already, take out your phone and text the word HEAT to 40649. You're gonna see some prompts pop up in your phone. I'll talk to you about that a little bit later when we get on the back end. Text the word HEAT to 40649. As we go through um, this conversation today, I wanna encourage you to comment for resonance. So whether you're in the chat box 
in, in the Zoom room or whether you're on a social media channel, go ahead and comment where things are resonating with you. You also can comment to lift up some questions that you have. We've got a whole team of us that are manning and, and, and facilitating the chat room so that we can get your feedback, your questions and bring them together. We also want you to comment when you're learning something new. If there's a new data point that drops or something that you didn't know, go ahead and drop that in the comment. You'll be surprised how much you might resonate with somebody else and we can together keep our learning and moving forward together. The other thing we wanna invite you to do, not just to ask questions in the chat box or in the comment section, but take some notes. Y'all heard me a few weeks ago, those of y'all that saw my Facebook Live, I said this whole town hall work is about us getting our game up. We are trying to dismantle a system that has been hardened for 400 years. It is not gonna disappear by itself. So we don't have to get our game up. Let me just translate that for those that might not be catching that black euphemism. What I mean is that we need to increase our understanding, our consciousness of what is happening around policing. Because a lot of us, when we think about policing, you think about somebody standing there in a blue shirt with a shiny badge, um, if you're from one part of the city, and then some of us have a whole different picture of stormtroopers running through our community. Regardless which picture you have, neither one of them really speaks to the robust nature that is the policing system. So take some notes so that we can learn, we can raise our consciousness so that we can engage in a much more uh, intellectual way. So I wanna just talk to us really quick about what the heat work is. The heat work comes out of our Live Free work. Live Free is a national campaign of Pico California and Faith in Action is a national campaign to work on reducing gun violence, ending mass incarceration, and transforming the public safety system into one that we can trust. We've been rocking and rolling for 10 years in the Live Free campaign work. And so we want to invite you to continue being a part of our Live Free work. You can go to livefreeusa.org and you'll find ways there where you can get locked in and engage and respond and be a part of this movement. But we want to talk really quickly about what the heat framework is. The first thing we want to tell you when we talk about bringing the heat, one of the things that we're talking about is there are three phases that we want to think about how we bring the heat. The first phase, go ahead and throw this slide up. The, the first phase, not yet on hiring, the first phase is actually in our move to dismantle the police state. We want to fire all racist cops. And we know some of us might say, man, that's a super low bar. But do you know that it has never yet been in the history of this country legislated that you cannot be a racist and be a cop? And so we want to ensure that in this first phase, we are calling on all of our public officials, our, our people that are currently in law, uh, law enforcement, we want to call on them to make the public pledge to fire all racist cops. And they can go to bringtheheat.info. You can send that out to people. We can call our legislators. We'll talk about that on the back end and get them to make the public pledge to fire all racist cops. What that's going to begin to do is set some policies in place and some culture in place for us to move to phase number two, which is to defund and replace the, pub, the current policing system with ultimately something that we can trust, but we need to defund the police. I wanna say really quickly what that means, because some of us, when we hear defund the police, you hear we're gonna not just have any public safety uh, people in our communities at all, and we're just gonna have an anarchy. And you start getting all scared, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, we're not gonna have nobody that's gonna be able to take care of me, and I'm so scared because somebody's gonna come and steal my bottle of water, and I'm so scared, and y'all trying to get rid of the police, that's what y'all mean. When y'all say defund the police, y'all trying to put me at risk and get me, you know what I'm saying, knocked upside my head when, when, when I'm in my community. Y'all, that's not what we're saying. Get our game up, get our game up. When we say defund the police, what we are saying is that there is a lot of resources that are currently put in the policing structure that need to be defunded and then used in community-based alternatives that empirical data shows provides us more safety. But on the front end, policing is resource at way too high a level. So we want to cut all of these policing budgets in half as a starting point. And then we want to get rid of the parts of the current policing structure that respond to mental health, that staff schools, that respond to many of our loved ones that might be involved in neighborhood and community violence. 
We want to get rid of that money that policing is using right now and invest that money in community-based outcomes that has empirical data that we can actually reduce violence in our communities. We can make the kids safer in our schools and we can respond better to those who have mental health challenges in our community without spending money to hire police officers to do that. So we want to cut the police budgets in half. Then we want to reduce the footprint of police and that's going to leave us with a smaller amount of police and a policing structure in our city. And then that is when we move to phase three, which is to reconstruct remaining systems. So we want to scale up a new public safety system. I'm not saying we want to scale up a new policing system. We want to scale up a new public safety system over the course of a generation. There is 400 years coming to build this current structure that we have. It's going to take some time to rebuild and reconstruct a new institution. When they ended slavery at the end of the Civil War, they had a period called Reconstruction. We're going to have to get into that same energy around Reconstruction so that we can scale up a new community safety model that is not about protecting us from each other, but is actually about providing security for us. And we've got some steps over the next several weeks that we're going to be walking you through around how we can actually engage around that. But the HEAT framework stands for hiring, equipment, accountability, and training. We're going to talk about hiring a little bit on the after uh, round, but hiring, we want to change who's in our communities and who can even be responsible for participating with public safety equipment, which we'll touch on next week. We, the people, need to be the ones who have authority to say what kinds of equipment we want in our communities that create safety and what would it look like if we could liquidate all of this military grade equipment and defund the policing structure through liquidating the tanks and all of this artillery that these law enforcement agencies have and take that money and reinvest them in community-based alternatives to make us safe. The A is for accountability. We need to both pass policies and we need to leverage citizen oversight commissions. We are supposed to be in a democracy where the people are actually overseeing the structures that are designed to keep them safe. And we need to pass very strong policies that make it so that the people who are in public safety, unless they are seeking to be guardians informed by the people in a new model, not the slave-based patrol policing model, but a new model, if they don't want to be in it, we want to run them away. Like you run off some racks that's under the bottom of your house. We want to run them away. That helps us defund the existing police structure. And then the last thing is training. For the remaining individuals who are still around to be a part of providing public safety, what would it look like if the only way that you could participate with providing public safety is if you were a trained anti-racist? Can y'all imagine that? If the people in our communities providing public safety were trained anti-racists who were showing up with an analysis and training not to provide protection and occupation, but to provide security and render aid. That's what the HEAT framework is about. It is a framework that helps us understand how we defund the policing structure. So we're not just talking about hot rhetoric that we're throwing out, but how do you actually defund the policing structure in a way that then enables us to erect a new structure that is worthy of community trust? We're gonna start off now with an opening conversation with a segment that we take just a little bit earlier because the times were struggling to work out a little bit, a conversation with California Senator Kamala Harris, with my brother, Pastor Mike McBride, who joined us last week live, and our dear brother, W. Kamal Bell from CNN. One of the things that we recognize in this moment is that we are experiencing two major shifts of both structural racism showing up through the COVID-19 pandemic meeting us in this reality of the need to really confront this 400 year story of policing and structural racism that we've been dealing with. And so we're having this conversation with Senator Kamala Harris to talk about, as we are thinking about this moment in the pandemic, how is she thinking about, and so take some notes, because just because she's the senator for some of us that live in California and, and represents a body for all of us that live around the country, just because she got the role don't mean she got the answers. 
So make some notes and we're gonna have a quick conversation with her about how policing is showing up in this moment and what is really in this Justice and Policing Act that right now is going through the Congress and the uh, Senate floors. So sit back, take a look at this next segment and then I'll be back for us to go into more conversation. All right, everybody, here we are. We are live, a special Thursday edition for Mass for the People. This is the bootleg preacher, Michael McBride, and the great W. Kamal Bell. What it do, bro? You know, we're out here in these streets, we're currently in this house, but you know, it's, there's a lot of work to do, and so we had to have a special episode because we are honored to have as a guest, Senator Kamala Harris here with us. Here she is, live and in color. It's the Senator, welcome to the Bring the heat, live free, mass for the people show. On oh, no, that's right. It's good to be with you both. And thank you for your voice and your leadership always and, and the way you inspire. Thank you. Well, it's 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 a joy to uh, really be alive in this moment. I mean, even with yeah. all the catastrophes that are happening, uh, what, three, four weeks ago, we were totally consumed by the first catastrophe of COVID-19. Right. We were going to have you on to talk about the mm-hmm. Bill of Rights and all the stuff you're doing. And now, two weeks later, we're talking about abolishing the police. Woo! <laughs> what a what a what a shift! What a change! I mean, what what do you think about everything that's been happening? Um, it has been a radical shift. What, what's your thoughts just on what's going on generally in the country? I mean, if you connect to your point, right? We're looking at three crises, um, which were all in the making. Mm. And and some in the making more recently than other, but but the but the consequence of each of them is knocking on the door of of history of America, right? Mm. So you look at the coronavirus, and and we knew that from the very beginning. Um, in fact, I created what we call the Racial Disparities Task Force because we knew that when you look at black folks in America, well, first of all, you look at the disease, COVID-19, it's a, it preys in particular on people who have pre-existing health conditions. So when you know black people in America are you know, 20% more likely to have asthma, COVID is a respiratory disease, uh, 40% more likely to have high blood pressure, black women are three times more likely to have lupus than other women. Uh, we knew that we already were vulnerable to this predatory disease. And then if you couple that, those pre-existing conditions, which are based on systemic racism and, and inequality in terms of issues of access to health care and, 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 and a good, good living, right? Mm-hmm. All the conditions that make for a healthy community. And then you combine that with the fact that currently for those who are diagnosed, the availability of treatment has been disproportionate. Um, we knew that this this was something, this pandemic that was tapping on the door of historical racial inequities. You look at the economic crisis that is the result of the public health crisis. Again, same point. Black families have one tenth the wealth of, of white families. Um, in the rollout of the PPP, Pastor Mike, the Paycheck Protection Program, ninety percent of minority owned small businesses and women owned businesses did not get the benefit of the PPP. Mm. Because what do we know about our black owned small businesses, our minority owned businesses? Most of them don't have the kind of banking relationships where they have that they know their banker by their first name who's associated with a big bank. A lot of them bank with community banks or they're not banked at all. They don't have lines of credit. Um, And so they got left out. So one of the things that I was dealing with is what we need to do to specifically carve out money for, for, for small businesses that have 10 and fewer employees, right? Because that, that really is the majority of the beauty shops, the barber shops, the florist, the nail salon, things of that nature, the bodega. And then you look at what's happening in terms of, you know, honoring the life of George Floyd, who, you know, we just collectively as a nation laid to rest yesterday. Um, I was with his brother yesterday. Um, and, you know, it, we look at, at the fact that this is something that's been going on from the beginning of time in America, from the beginning of time when 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 slaves were brought to this country and black life was treated as less than human. Mm. And and then you just track history, you know, f- through those days, through the the, 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 the century of lynching, um, through Emmett Till to Rodney King, to George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and we could go on down the list. Tatiana Jefferson, 
And so I, I look at these three things, these crises that are, are, are making themselves very clear and relevant and, and to this moment. And there is a connection, there is a, a line through, which all has to do with America's history of not fully dealing with its issue in terms of its dark issue of racism and race and, and never fully corrected um, the, the inequities and the unfairness and the brutality that has come from that. Yeah, yeah. And, and now out of the George Floyd uh, murder, there has been this talk about reform the police, defund the police. Yeah. And and I saw you on a, on on the view. What? Abolish. Abolish. <laughs> Abolish. Okay, we. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm not going to go for past no. <laughs> Defund the police. Defund the police. <laughs> Defund already scares my my Twitter followers. So we'll but we'll say abolish. <laughs> and I saw you on the view. I'm going to uh, allow you to to say how you feel about that, and I'm going to play the role of a silent Megan McCain. So can you, say, can you talk about where you fit into that into that discussion? Your thoughts there. Yeah, well, let's first let's understand that I I do believe that the essence and the and and the the point of it is you know regardless of what the hashtag is the point of it is the right point, which is that for too long status quo thinking has been to believe that you create more safety by putting more police officers on the street and that's mm -hmm. just simply wrong. And so we need to, it's long overdue that we reimagine how we achieve public safety in this country. And, and for me, that means understanding that healthy communities are safe communities. Mm. Point, point in case, when you go to upper class suburbia in America, you will not see those patrol cars you know, roam in the streets. You will not see the kind of police presence that you see in other communities, but what you will see well-funded public schools. What you will see, high rates of home ownership. What you will see are families who have jobs that not only sustain them through the end of the month so they don't have to worry about putting food on the table, but jobs that give them dignity and a, and a quality of life. So let's under, if they, what you will see in those communities is people who can afford healthcare and, and have access to healthcare on a regular basis. Healthy communities, are safe communities. So mm -hmm. if the goal is safety in a safe communities, understand healthy communities are safe communities. And then let's look at, are we actually distributing our resources and prioritizing taxpayer dollars around that fact? Mm -hmm. But I think that part of the problem is, I know part of the problem is in many cities, one third of its entire budget is policing. Now let's just think about that. Mm -hmm. Of all the responsibilities a city has to deliver services to its rep, its residents, one third of its budget is going to policing. So the point here is, let's all agree. If you invest in public education, if you invest in job training and skills development and jobs in a community, if you invest in making sure the small businesses of, of those communities have access to capital and the potential to grow, if you invest in, in the well-being of the people of that community, you, I promise you, will mm. have a safe community. Mm. Mm. Man, you know, I, you, you, you got me ready to shout. Like <laughs> time or something over here. I mean, I think, I, she, I think she might be reannouncing she's running for president. So I don't know. <laughs> make it on this show. Give us a lot of good news. I don't know. No, look, Joe Biden has to win this election. We have two choices. Yes, Joe yes, Biden yes. Or Trump. We need to win this election and elect Joe Biden. Like, yeah, very clear yeah, about that. I think we all agree on that. All, all jokes aside, I mean, what, one of the things that I I have uh, been telling our clergy. Um, in response to the young people is, you know, we should not become the wet blanket that is yeah. thrown on all of this radical imagination that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I talk to them about abolish the police, I'm, I'm talking about the system of policing. We talk about defunding it. We're talking about in its current form so we can have more money to put 
into all these things you're talking about. Right. We're talking about, you know, how do we get rid of these racist cops who have infiltrated our departments and are hanging out with the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists on the weekend and the alt-right boys and all these different kind of folks. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder, do you ever feel like there's a concern that folks in Congress may become a wet blanket on the on the dreams and aspirations of folks that are actually asking for something big? And 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 how does what you all are proposing yeah. now help us get closer to the big aspirations? Because you guys just rolled out yeah. a big package, but we want to keep the pressure on. So how do we make sure we not, don't become the wet blanket? Well, I mean, I think we want to make sure we don't get played, right? And um, mm -hmm. part of it is that, <laughs> You know, you can see that every time, every time historically, and we've all been in this a long time, every time we start talking about changing the system in a fundamental way, you know, folks don't like to use the word reform because it feels like it's too incremental. And I, and I get that too. Um, but when we talk about fundamentally changing or restructuring the system, there are huge obstacles within the system and the status quo that resist, if not fight against that change. And then politically, those who are invested in status quo or, or benefit from it in some way, dare I say even profit from it, will start to, to, to engage in the fear politics, the politics of fear. So that's what you see Donald Trump and his friends doing, right? Which is basically trying to suggest that when we talk about reimagining public safety, that somehow, oh, they're trying to get rid of all the police and, and create anarchy and, and lawlessness. And, and, and that is called the politics of fear so that it distracts people from the real conversation and it distracts people from what we all know. Right, Look, we are there. never, we are always going to want to know that there is consequence and accountability if a child is molested, if a woman is raped or if one human being kills another. Mm. So that, as far as I'm concerned, is non-negotiable. And I don't think it's, it really is negotiable for any of us, for mm. most of us. And, you and know, then but the, 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 it's the of fear and we've got to be careful that we don't, lay a trap um, and then fall in it, mm. which is to give them fodder to stoke the fear that will distract people from the need for change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about uh, the, the big initiative that you all are talking yeah. about before, because to your point, you know, I think a lot of us know that um, we need to have a new public safety system. You know, I think the Justin, the prison policy uh, project says that 5% of all arrests are for violent crimes, which just yeah. goes to show us yeah. that we don't necessarily need this big sprawling, you know, uh, group of individuals in the community just to respond to 5% of a threshold of stuff. So talk to us about your proposal and, and, and uh, I think we want to try to figure out how can, how can these pieces really fit together so we don't get played and lower yeah. the bar. Right. So um, the it's a it's a package of bills that's called Justice in Policing. Um, uh, me and my brother in the Senate, Cory Booker from New Jersey, um, it, together with other members of the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus on the House side, and we have a number of both members of the House and the Senate of every stripe um, as Democrats that have signed on to it. And so it is it is directed to one piece of this whole discussion and one piece specifically, which is accountability and consequence for bad policing. Mm -hmm. So it does not address what we need to do in terms of creating healthy and safe communities as, as we have discussed. It is specifically focused on the fact that in the criminal justice system, when we are talking about consequence and accountability, that conversation is always directed to the person who was arrested. And it is never a conversation about the system itself. And is the system held and are the players within the system held accountable? And is there consequence for them breaking the rules or breaking the law? So justice and policing as a package of bills includes what we need to do around pattern and practice investigations. I did those when I was attorney general. I did pattern and practice investigations for discrimination of law enforcement agencies in California. We need to give the United States Department of Justice subpoena power, which is real power to investigate patterns and practice of discrimination by law enforcement agencies in the United States. Another thing that we are doing is talking about the national, that there needs to be a national standard for use of force. So what am I talking about? 
Right now, if a police officer is accused of using excessive force, in most jurisdictions, the question in the courtroom is, was that use of force reasonable? Well, as we all know, you can reason away just about anything. Mm. So that's not a fair standard when we're talking about the kinds of cases that we're seeing. So we're saying instead the question should be, was that use of force necessary? So changing the standard and making that the national standard. And then one of the other big pieces is independent investigations. And again, I know this as, as a former prosecutor, no matter how well intentioned that prosecutor, the DA, the state's attorney, the reality is that when their department works day to day with that police department, that when there is an officer in that department that should be investigated, at the very least, there's an appearance of a conflict. And so there should be independent investigations. It shouldn't be that prosecutor's office that works with that police department every day that is doing the investigation. Because if we're gonna talk about justice as a concept, but also as a reality, it's not only about actual justice, but also the appearance of justice that allows us to be true to those words inscribed in the, you know, in the United States Supreme Court, equal justice under law. So those are some of the key components. It also includes chokeholds. It includes um, what we need to do around data collection and transparency in the system. Uh, but it, it, so it's a whole package and it includes also, you may have seen me trying to fight with folks on the floor of the Senate on our um, anti-lynching bill. And so that's in there too. I, I wrote an anti-lynching bill a couple years ago and still trying to fight to get that done. Uh, Senator Harris, what do you say to people? It could be activists, could be everyday people who, who because uh, you as attorney general were part of the criminal justice system, don't trust you to be one of the voices of change in the criminal justice system. Well, come on, you know, I, let me just tell you something. I grew up experiencing most of what I'm talking about in terms of the abuses of the system. There's not a black man I know, be he a relative or a friend who has not experienced some form of profiling, of excessive force, of unreasonable stop or seizure. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And so when I, and my, my parents were active in the civil rights movement, marching in Oakland and Berkeley, California in the 1960s. So after leaving Howard University, going to law school, I made a very conscious decision to become a prosecutor. It was a conscious decision because I said, why do we only have to be on the outside trying to knock down the doors to change the system. Why not also, isn't there a role for us to go inside the system to try and change it? But I'm gonna tell you something. When I, did, I, I went to the DA's office in 1990, I was elected attorney general, I mean, a district attorney of San Francisco in 2003. This was years before the beauty of the strength and brilliance of Black Lives Matter. And what Black Lives Matter has done to put the pressure on these systems that when you're inside of it work so fiercely against trying you trying to change it and then to have those activists on the outside coupled with having some of us on the inside that's the, that's where i believe the beauty is in the in the ability to actually force the change to happen against and believe me very powerful forces that are against that change happening mm. and that's just a reality of it um you know so i got some things done as attorney general i opened up california's data data system which never was open so activists had to claw that information out and get public records requests and I made it open and transparent, specifically around things like uh, deaths in custody and arrest rates based on race. I created one of the first in the nation um, initiatives that was about saying that all, throughout the state, we should have reentry initiatives um, to get formerly incarcerated jobs and, and, and all that they need to reenter um, the community. I created, I believe the first in the nation required implicit racial bias and procedural justice training for police officers. And these are just a few of the things that we are able to accomplish, certainly not enough, which is why I keep working on it. It has been my life's work to keep working on this and I'm not gonna stop. Well, I'm happy to hear you say you welcome the pressure from activists because activists yeah. are here and they're like, all right. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's right. And you know, people ask me, they say, well, what, you know, I've been doing interviews the last few days and the last couple of weeks. And they say, well, what would you say to the people marching on the street? And, and, and what I say is keep marching. 
Keep marching, keep shouting. If folks hadn't marched and shouted, the three of us wouldn't be on this this call right now. And I know I would not be the second woman only in the history of the United States, black woman to be elected to the United States Senate. So keep marching and keep that, keep that foot on the gas because the change will not happen by itself. It will not happen by itself. It will be because that pressure is there, because that passion is there, and because people require their government to live up to, or at least come close to what we say are the ideals of our country. And, and by the way, that's a true form of patriotism as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Well, it's, it's, it's a blessing to, to be able to hear you kind of affirm that. You know, I think sometimes a lot of us who are in the streets and get arrested and shut down freeways and stuff. And then you go into meetings with politicians and folks like that, that you don't have a relationship with. You just think, you know, are we all at odds with each other? We don't always agree, um, but it's great to know that um, the, the processes that happen for change can indeed be complementary. Um, on your way out the door, we've been asked folks to make these pledges around uh, in the 300 years of being in uh, this profession of, of law enforcement. We've not had a consensus in this country that you can't be a racist. You know, hanging out with the Proud Boys and the Ku Klux Klan and all right and be a cop. I mean, do you think that we got to start laying the gauntlet down and saying, if you're going to be in communities of color, any community, you can't have racial animus or these kind of extremist affiliations and then show up on Monday uh, in, a, in a suit and a pistol talking about I'm here to represent the state. Um, I think hopefully your bill will address that. But what would you say to folks who are trying to get this this momentum around that kind of consensus? The point is absolutely spot on right. Listen, the thing about, there, the, you know, people want to talk about the social contract, right? The reality is that we, the people, society give police officers the, the, the ability to carry a badge and gun. They, they, they have those because we have invested those in them with an assumption that they will do the right thing and do justice and do it in and out. That's why I created that bi implicit bias training, right? And, and to the extent that they carry bias, do everything they can to be conscious of it and not let it inform their decisions. Anybody who is associated with organizations that are clearly meant to invoke and incite and, and, and further hate and division and racism and some of those organizations and, and promote the, the violence associated with that racism, of course they should not be a police officer. They should not be, there's no question. And, and here's the other thing that is just also a fact. Bad cops are bad for good cops. Mm. And everything that is developed around the system should be to understand also that we need to, there has to be a reciprocal relationship, meaning you, ha you give trust and you earn trust. Um, it, it has to go both ways and you cannot possibly earn my trust or the community's trust if you have evidence the fact that you are a racist. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to say, Brother Kamal Bell, this is the great senator from the state of California. I think he represents us from time to time, dear brother. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to take my daughter down there for your presidential announcement, but it was too crowded, so we just had to listen to that. Well, let's, when, when we get past, you know, the Rona, let's, let's make that happen. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us, everyone. Um, uh, just policing, just, what's the policing act again that you... you Justice in police and please, please push for it. Again, it does not pretend to be what's going to be the whole solution. It is a piece of it. It is about accountability and consequence. All right, Justice in Policing Act. And uh, uh, we are so grateful for you to squeeze us in. I know you have a real right. busy day. We can talk to you all day long, but you got to go back up there and do your protest. <laughs> That's right. By the way, you know, without the kid take cloth, and we'll go do ours out of the <laughs> All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, all right. So we are back. We back. Um, we had that interesting conversation there with uh, Debbie Kamal Bell, uh, my brother in the struggle and biology, Pastor Mike McBride and Senator Kamala Harris of California. 
listen, here's the reality. If you anything like me, and I was, I've been looking at some of the comments and the questions that, that are popping up for folks, some of that you liked and some of that you didn't. Some of that you were like, hmm, okay, now that's interesting. And some of that you was kind of side-eyeing a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You was a little bit kind of like, hmm, I don't, I don't know about all of that. You know, what about this? What about that? You know, you, you were putting your questions in the box. We are not missing your questions. Some of these questions, remember, this session is about H for hiring. And we're going to be taking more of these questions. A lot of us are asking questions about equipment. You're asking questions about accountability. You're asking questions about training. And so all of those questions were going to be happening in session three, four, five, and six. And we've been answering a lot of you all's questions as we started off already. We carried some of those questions that you all lifted up both today and um, yes, the last week into the conversation with Senator Harris. So keep sharing your questions and your thoughts with us because that's what's actually going to help shape our conversation over the next month and some change. Want to take just a quick moment because you may have jumped on since this started. If you haven't done this already, take out your phone and text the word HEAT, H-E-A-T, text the word HEAT to 40649. Text the word HEAT to 40649 so that you can get signed up for this work. We need to be doing ongoing work. I want y'all to repeat after me real quick. I, I, I touched on this on, on my show, The Daily Fight, on Instagram um, earlier this week. One of the powerful words that comes from some of our leaders. Repeat after me. An organized lie is always more powerful than disorganized truth. Say it again. An organized lie is always more powerful than disorganized truth. Right. So now if I'm being a black preacher, I would tell you, test somebody and say, organize the truth. You're on this call because we need to organize the truth. And so you've heard some stuff, some of it you're buying, some of you not. But this is about getting our game up, our collective consciousness so that we can dismantle this police state. We got to listen to people who have been engaged in this system, who know some things about it that we don't. Not that they got all the solutions, because I just didn't hear all the solutions, but now we're about to go into the conversation about hiring. This session is H for hiring, as we deal with heat. And I want to welcome in uh, our special guest today, that we have a brother who wears more hats uh, than a hat store. Uh, Reggie Lyles is a former deputy police chief here in the Bay Area, a former Black Panther, a brother who uh, has been raised in and around the struggle or was, or was raised in the Black Panther energy. I don't want to uh, credential him the wrong way. A brother who comes from our faith communities who is going to help us have a conversation and understand, particularly around police departments and about hiring. Uh, brother Reggie, thank you so much. I'm glad you all decked out in your beautiful uh, daishiki and rocking for the culture. Um, I wonder if, if, you know, I've certainly got a few questions that I would love um, to bring to our folks because we need to understand around hiring um, in the local police departments. And you served for decades in, in the department and you saw a lot of different things and you've served as a mentor to myself and Pastor Mike and many of us who have sought to try to undo these kind of racist systems. And so I just wonder, you know, Reggie, as we start off the conversation, uh, what problems particularly around hiring have led to the disproportionate racist policing that we have been experiencing uh, over the last, not just few decades, but really, you know, over, over the lifeblood of all of it. I, I wonder if you could just speak to that um, as you, as someone who's been on the inside, what is the problem in this whole policing structure and what is the role that hiring has in it? Well, first, uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, this is a deep uh, conversation and uh, I hope we can ferret out some nuggets out of this. Um, first of all, it's just the history of law enforcement. The history of law enforcement wasn't designed to be a diverse unit. It was designed to be a group of white males to go catch runaway slaves. So they're surely not gonna hire runaway, uh, I mean, slaves uh, to catch other runaway slaves. I mean, I, I guess some folks could argue that, that it, that's what happened in, in parts of Jamaica um, with the Kampong, uh, the Maroon men, uh, but that's a historical argument. Um, wow. Rexy, Reg, Reggie's so popular, he got people calling the actually my hours. cousin Marcus Reg, Allen calling. Reg, all right, keep going, Reggie. <laughs> okay, so anyway, it's, it's the history of, of law. It's the history of um, uh, of law enforcement, and they, so they didn't want um, uh, women in the, the department, 
They didn't want uh, African Americans in the department or Asians in the department. So its its foundation is based on bias. And so once we understand that, folks who got into law enforcement literally had to fight their way in. They had to do everything that you can imagine uh, to, to get into uh, the police department. The Black Panther Party originally said, look, uh, we're going to establish a group, Black Panther Party, for self-defense. It wasn't defending against um, other criminals in the neighborhood in North Oakland or Oakland. It was defending the, themselves against uh, police officers who were abusive against them. So they decided to follow the police officers just to observe them because it was under our constitutional right to do that. Of course, the police didn't appreciate that and tensions rose up and uh, folks didn't back down and you had the tensions and you know the history. So um, uh, once the doors opened, uh, after people took to the streets and marched and, and demonstrated and said, we want to hire uh, a more diverse police agency, they opened it up to people of color, mostly males. Women came in far behind, maybe, maybe another decade before they started letting women into the force. <clears throat> and so it's always been based on the history of not wanting to have inclusion, inclusion or uh, be inclusive. So let me, let me just jump in here real quick. So I'm hearing you lift up a couple things, Reggie. One, that both race and patriarchy, racism and patriarchy yes. played a role in creating the kind of hiring structures yes. that we currently have right now in our situations. Yes. And we know how that has created a very toxic experience for the way that, that public safety has, has been delivered. I wonder if you, if you could also say and speak to a little bit um, around, you, you spent you know, over 20 years being involved in law enforcement and, and even amidst that, because you know, we've talked about in our work, we're talking about defunding these police departments because we believe it's just way too many people and too many services and resources have been, are being used in the police department when they could be used in other things. Could you speak to what you've seen in times past where there have been programs that, and, and there have been strategies that instead of hiring more police officers, you've seen models and you've seen it in your own work where you've hired outside of the police department, different entities to provide safety around mental health services and around other ways to respond to crises that don't necessitate this challenge we've had about having white males in our community that are creating this kind of state violence. Before I get to that, let me quickly just say this that uh, it's also based on some racist assumptions that white men or white folk are more intelligent and smarter and more honest and, 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 and people of color uh, are perpetually more sinister and criminal and all that. All that's racist crap. And, and, and if you don't get rid of that you, and you will allow that to remain as a, a, a belief system, it becomes philosophy. And then, it, and then it denies people access and then promotion and then being in charge, et cetera. But you're talking about uh, you know, different ways of policing a community. There are myriad of ways of policing a community. You don't always have to have a police officer uh, responding and doing everything um, who has a gun on and, um, and has to respond in a short period of time because you got to get back into uh, in service, uh, dealing with a certain kinds of problems. Oftentimes, different entities within the community are better served or, or, or better capable of responding to those situations. I can remember in my career, and I, and I spent 30 years in law enforcement, in my career, I've experienced, uh, we used, in Berkeley, we had mental health workers that came and dealt with people who were under various um, emotional and, um, and mental stressors. And, um, and, and the police could then go back into service uh, or in the midst of uh, family dis disagreements, they really don't need a police officer. They need, once they calm down, they need somebody who has some psycho, uh, psychology training and, and around family dynamics that can work out whatever uh, issue it was to bring about peace. 
Then we, I remember we uh, put monies into, um, we used to call it the juvenile bureau. We used to round up some of these uh, young men who they thought were marginal and they weren't marginal. What was, they just had a lot of energy, had no place to put it. And we provided them ways of uh, uh, dealing with that, that kind of energy. We used to take folks on trips down the Stanislaus River, river rafting and, and all of that. Some of those guys that, that were under me right now are Hollywood actors. Some of them are a PhD a professor at Minnesota. One of them is my very good friend, William Brew, uh, has got two sons. It's, it's, so, so, that, so, so, that way, means, so, so that means you saying, Reggie, that actually by defunding, instead of putting so much resources in police and using other strategies, you're telling me that after 20 years, you've seen healthy outcomes happen in ways to respond to these safety dynamics and people to make better choices. Is that what you're telling me, Reggie? I'm telling you that. that my, I, have, I got friends on this line right now that's, that's listening to me talk right now who are professors at universities that, 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 we, that, that the police or the society said were marginal. They weren't marginal. They maybe came from a single parent home and their mother was working and they needed some energy, some, yeah. some place to put that. But I also want to raise up ceasefire because I was working in Gene Kwan's mayor's office when I got close to ceasefire and recognized how powerful yeah. that was. Ceasefire was the most amazing thing to me because it identified people who had the potential of some extreme violence and they got to them, earned their trust. They moved them out of harm's way. That's right. And, 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 it, and what, what did that do? Only for a short period of time. It saved lives. Well, not only did it save lives, Reggie, but we reduced, Reggie is referencing something uh, called Oakland Ceasefire, the work that we did. Y'all can Google a case study for hope. Google a case study for hope, and you will find an academic report by the Giffords Law Center that actually showed that by, instead of hiring more police, we invested in the city of Oakland around violent crime, and we reduced homicides by nearly 50% over five years without hiring more police. So this is empirical data that shows that if we invest not in only hiring more police, but actually defund the police department and invest that in more community-based alternatives and strategies, we can get better results. Now, here's one more thing, Reggie, I need you to speak to quickly because we got some questions that people are, are lifting up for you already. Some people want to know, man, where, where did Reggie police at? He, he policed in the city of Berkeley, the supposed bastion of liberal liberalism and democracy, but we're not even going to go there and he policed in other cities. Let me, let me say this, Reggie, because this is what I really need you to speak to just briefly, because then I want to get some of these questions people have put in the box that you can speak to as someone who's retired from this profession and is one of the biggest advocates for transforming this public safety dynamic. You know, and I've learned from you, that these police unions are some of the biggest, you know, challenging institutions we have in this conversation, particularly around hiring, because they negotiate the contracts with the city and with the mayor, and they're the ones that create this kind of hiring experience for cities that cause us to end up having the wrong people in our cities providing public safety. Even if we dismantle this whole system, the police unions are the ones who are always trying to ensure that there's no accountability. And you know, we've come up with a theory, Reggie, I haven't tested it with you yet, but we said on your first justified uh, complaint where you're using force against the people, we want to slash 10% of their pension. We're going to talk about this when we get to accountability. On the second justified complaint, we want to slash 50% of their pension. And on the third one, we want to slash 75% so you cannot live off the dime of these people when you're out here doing that payment. We're going to talk about that in the accountability yeah. one in a couple weeks. So y'all got to make sure you come back for that. Reggie, can you speak to the role of police unions that they play in this conversation? I, there's a role for police unions. Okay. Believe me, trust me. They should have, we, I'm, so I'm an advocate for police unions. I'm not an advocate for the kind of unionization where they end up uh, defending the very worst kind of Derek Chauvin type of officer while, that could stay on a department some uh, with 17 complaints and has been responsible for shooting three people and then ultimately 
uh, has his foot on the neck of someone using a tactic that's outlawed. That person I'm sure was there because all of this energy in unionization of law enforcement ends up unfortunately is protecting the what they like to call the bad rotten apple. Yeah. So we never can get rid of the people who need to not be in the law enforcement. If you're in law enforcement and you feel like you gotta um, beat somebody from an inch of their life or take steal from them or or have sexual assaults on, on folks, you don't belong in law enforcement. Now what the union does is mix those guys amongst people who do an outstanding job uh, uh, in law enforcement. We're not talking about them. We're talking about the people who are the uh, the immoral, unethical uh, police officers. We all know who they are in law enforcement. Y'all every, know who they are. So oh, you, of course you do. Every, every officer in the locker room knows who it is. They don't like to associate with them. They, 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 you know, they, they talk oh, about so and so. But why they don't? But why they don't? Why they don't tell on them, though, Reggie? Why well, they don't but, tell it, on it, them? Well, okay, hold on. Now you, uh, the reason why they don't tell on them is because you got that that blue wall of secrecy. You got to be an ethical officer. That means what? That means that if you're an officer, you're not going to be popular. I'm a, I'm a, I hate to let you, uh, I know I wasn't popular. I, I know for not a doubt and probably still not popular, but that doesn't mean I don't love policing. I love delivering service and protection to my community. But if you got somebody in here abusing people, take or having, it, having the, the dog handler and allowing the dog to take extra bites on someone or beating somebody when they're handcuffed, uh, or choking them out and their sunglasses don't move, that guy did not belong in law enforcement. So just like Kamala Harris said, um, those guys put pressure on people who are in law enforcement who want to do the job, who believe in the oath of the ethical oath that they took. And okay. they don't they don't see police in their community as being anything other than a servant to their community. So, so let's do a rapid fire real quick. We're gonna do a rapid fire round with Reggie. Now, since your name start with, with, with R. Rapid fire round for Reggie. And we ain't talking about no gunshots. We talking about rapid fire of questions. So first question, give me a, give me a quick answer, Reggie. Benjamin Mertz out there said, are there, uh, sorry to put your last name, bro. Benjamin said out there, uh, are there, um, what specifically should we be asking our local departments, police departments now about their hiring practices? What, what's the question that they should be asking people? Rapid fire. The question I would ask is, what are you doing wrong or what can you do better to determine the, um, the person who is not suited for law enforcement? Something you are doing or not doing well enough or need to do better because we got so many of these Derek Chauvin's in, 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 in law enforcement. Why can't you catch them early? So maybe we need a, a different uh, psychological examination. Maybe we need to do polygraphs for everybody again. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. we need to set different standards. Let, mm -hmm. me, let me get this in. This is very controversial. Anecdotally, who is the one that does most of the shooting? It's always the white male officer. That's anecdotal. Rarely, sometimes it's the white female. Rarely though. Hardly ever the black, female, black male or black female hardly ever the Asian male or female, hardly ever the Latinx uh, male or female. So why is it that it's the white male that's always afraid for his life and shooting people? So, so if me, that's true, why are you keep hiring that person? That's me, the kind of question that I ask. All right, let me get one more in because I know you were talking about your Ford Police Union. You know, I'm, I'm always pushing hard against these police unions because I identify them to be a lot. A lot no, I'm, I'm a, that, this is a union state, uh, Ben. I'm for you. Just my daddy was a union guy. And, I know. Uh, I'm Me too. Union. Me too. My dad. My dad was a teamster too. But I think that there's there's some white supremacist orientations that are showing up in these police unions for sure. Oh, yeah. No question. That, yeah. I don't, so I don't disagree with that. So what what then? Considering can can you speak to what is the role that police unions play around the hiring? The police union doesn't play a, much of a role around the hiring, other than um, influence. Uh, about who do they uh, influence? Peer influence. Well, it, see, I don't want to lead you down that road. 
You know, right. before, listen, before a person is hired, they have no union rights. Right. You, you got to understand, I'm trying to teach you something now. The, the, what, what you want to focus in on hiring is be scrutiny on trying to find out the person that's not suited for law enforcement. They have no rights before they come on. They haven't paid a nickel into the union. The union has no say on hiring. If you go down this road that you're talking about union and hiring, they're going to let you go down the road and then they're going to drop a, 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 you know, a trump on you. And they say, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, they have no right. I hear you. Then we're going to come back to them around accountability because we know that some of the challenges that we've had in police unions with some of them have been them providing and fighting for the, the kind of protection in and around some of these. That's a different question. They okay. Either, see, okay. see, if you ask the question wrong, you'll, you'll get the, the wrong answer. Listen, the, the question you're asking uh, is for people who are already in the department that have government code, code 33 rights. They have those rights, that's union. But prior to hiring, prior to getting sworn in, they have no rights at all. So this is where the strength in your effort ought to be. We ought to be focusing on saying, chief of police, mayor, why are you constantly hiring the kind of person that ends up shooting us and killing us and stalking us and, and lying on police reports? And, and then uh, when you catch them in a lie, double down on the lie. Well, I don't, I, I don't understand that. It shocks me. Why can't you find that guy before he gets or she gets hired? And that's where the scrutiny needs to be. All maybe right. you need, maybe we need to bring in a third entity to come in and do the hiring. Maybe we need, maybe we need the police to do the hiring and have some, some professors in psychology to come in and observe the hiring and see what you're doing wrong. Maybe the hiring is too uh, 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 involved with people who don't live in our community, uh, on the police department, been on the police department 10 or 12 years, got a business in the community, but they closed down at five. They don't live here. Maybe we need to get on the oral board. Maybe we need to get Bubba on the on the oral board. Maybe we need to uh, uh, get you on the oral board. And Come maybe on, we man. need him to say, look, we're not going to hire this guy because right. I've seen him. I know him. He has racist animus. Now, um, that's how you stop uh, the problem coming into your department. Once they get in, in, in California, and they got the government code 3300 protection, it is the most difficult thing to, to, to ferret out a, a, a bad officer. Now, I know that we used to do it, and then they get their jobs back. And we have to pay back pay and, and all of that stuff. But therein lies the problem. So let me, let me say this. We're going to have to bring you back. Reggie, because I think when we get into the conversation about accountability, we, we need this wisdom around understanding how we engage in the world as it is. I want to say to everybody that's, that's, that's listening to Brother Reggie, where he's been super helpful to me is none of us has all the answers. And we need to learn from our elders who have walked this journey before us. We cannot be people who show up with a, a short and a misguided analysis. There is wisdom in and around this, and we need to learn, all of us, including myself, our work and practice. Y'all keep hearing me say, we got to get our game up so that we can engage, because guess what? We joined a part of a 400-year-old liberation struggle. We've just caught the baton. Our role is to do well in our moment so we can pass something off um, to, to the next generation. Reggie, give us a last 60-second um, um, charge of what you would want to call people from all over the country to be thinking about and policing. We're going to have you back in the town hall, I promise, because I got some more that we, we need your trusted voice to help us understand. But give us a 60 second charge to folks around the country. The, you have the power. The power rests with the people. Always have, always will. Don't let nobody talk you out of it. We have had too, too many examples of what the people have done that bring about legitimacy. The folks who got together around the Oscar Grant's shooting, citizens, and, and, and changed that whole department. We changed the department up here in Nevada. We changed the LA Police Department and this LA County Sheriff's Department have been dramatically changed because of citizens. 
We need citizen oversight. And I must end with, say this, without a doubt, in the city of Oakland, Measure LL, 80% uh, of the citizens of Oakland supported that thing. And it's and, and it and it's given oversight over a, a police department that had been running amok. So I'm telling you, you have the power. It's a prolonged struggle. It's not anything that can be done overnight. We don't quit. We don't quit. We don't look for short slogans in quick conversations. This is in-depth and study. Become experts. You can do it. Thank you, Reggie. We love you. We'll 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 love bring you. you back. Go go ahead and stop your video, and we're gonna go ahead and and transition as we get ready to close. Listen, y'all. You have been a part of a powerful conversation, and I'm hope you, I hope you experiencing it that way. You didn't agree with everything that Senator Harris said. You didn't agree with everything that Reggie said. You didn't agree with everything I said. You didn't agree, agree with everything that W. Kamau or Pastor Mike said. Unity is not uniformity. As Reggie was saying, we must come together to dismantle the police state in America, and it is going to take the, the collection of our shared experience and work to really transform this system. Listen, none of us has the silver bullet for liberation and freedom. If you did, we would already be there. So let's check our ego at the door and let's come in and do the necessary important work. The questions and the comments you all have been putting in are fantastic and they are shaping and will continue to shape where we go from here. But now it's time for our call to action. We got about five more minutes left before we let you go. We have to do the work. I said this on the daily fight, the show I have on Instagram, if you're not with me already on Instagram, follow me at Instagram, at Ben J. McBride, at Ben J. McBride. Every Tuesday at 12, I go live with The Daily Fight, and we have some in-depth, more intimate kind of conversation. Listen, I said on The Daily Fight this last Tuesday, the system has no problem with you protesting. The system has no problem with you having your cathartic release. The system has no problem with you going outside and getting it off your chest, and we need to do that. But the way we make change is we organize. Yes. All politics is local. And so we must organize locally. There are 17,000 plus police departments in the United States of America, and not one of them is exactly alike. So you must be engaged with your local police department, your local city council people, your local mayor. You must be in conversation with these people. They got to know who you are. We cannot just protest organize, organize, organize. You might say, I'm not an activist. That don't matter. You can organize. The power rests with the people and we must organize. So again, if you haven't done it already, the first thing I want you to do, get your phone out, text the word HEAT to 40649 so that we can get you resources and you will find a prompt as you do that. So go ahead and do it now if you haven't done it already. What you will see is that it will give you prompts that enable you to begin to call your legislators. And so you can see the map. And we started it last week. Look at what's happened just from last week. The people, we have over 500 advocates from across the country who are popping up in Colorado and Florida, Alabama and Louisiana and Texas and California, New York and New Jersey and, and, and Tennessee and Arkansas. We got people popping up in Washington, Oregon, from all over the country, in Minnesota, in Michigan. Go ahead and do it right now. I see more of you all are popping up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are signing ourselves up for the long-term work of dismantling the police state. Listen, everybody does not have to do the same thing, but everybody has to do something. So you might be a creative, you might be an artist, you might be somebody who actually is great at tech and administration. There is a role for you in this work as well. But the first way, some more people just jumped on in California. Thank you. I'm, I'm seeing a map popping up. I hope this is getting you encouraged in the same way. Thank you. I think that's Colorado. Some more people tapping in. This is the work that we've got to do. You've all got to roll. We've all got to roll. So let's do that together. After you go in, though, don't just sign up. When we finish, I want you to go hit the links that come to you via the text message and start putting in some calls to your legislators. It's going to give you the ability to talk to your mayor, to talk to your city council person, even to talk to your governor. More people are popping up all across the country. We just grew by 20 more people. Text 
heat to 40649. We're going to make sure that we do this together. This is nobody's trying to take advantage of you. I don't want your money. Some more people just tapped in. It's just dope. We don't want your money. This is about us getting free. Let's finally get free, man. Can you imagine what would have happened if during the time that Harriet Tubman was building the Underground Railroad, there were some people saying that we just want to have a better version of slavery? Y'all, I don't want no better version of slavery, and neither do you. Let's get free. Let's do the work to dismantle this racist policing system and scale up a new public safety apparatus that is not about policing, but is about providing security, that is about providing protection for the people. And we need to defund this existing police structure and state, and then let's use those resources to erect and reconstruct something that is worthy of all of our lives. So you're doing that, you're taking action, we love that. Let's leave the map up there. The other thing I want you to do over this next week, show up at a local action. Show up at a local action or protest if you can. If you can't show up because maybe you're differently able or you got to just make sure you take care of yourself because we are in still right now pandemic. That's why we got you can also go to masks for the people. Y'all see that mask for the people. <clears throat> you can go to maskforthepeople.org and we've got hand sanitizer and we've got masks that you can purchase at a super low rate so you can pass them out at your protest. Matter of fact, I, I, I probably should go on because I've been in here sweating. See, I'm putting on some hand sanitizer right now, right? I'm, I'm getting so fresh, so clean. I will put it on as a little cologne, but that would be putting a little too much on it. But let's, let's make sure we show up at an action over the next seven days, go to one. Like for me, I just was at an action a couple of days ago in Oakland. I live here in the Bay Area. On Sunday, I'm going to be marching in San Francisco. We're going to be protesting in San Francisco. So shout out to all my San Francisco loved ones. I'm a child of Frisco myself. If you're in San Francisco, meet us at 2 o'clock. San Francisco uh, at 3rd and... Um, third and Fitzgerald. Meet us at two o'clock on Sunday, third and Fitzgerald. Find a protest in your local area or action and show up for that. Here's the other thing that we need you to do. You might be watching this on Facebook or you might be in the Zoom room and you're watching it on Zoom. We want you to go to Facebook after this and start a watch party or and tag 10 people. We got to spread the message, y'all. You can't hold this to yourself. Start a watch party and tag 10 of your friends that you know did not see this so that you can bring 10 people to it. So total, we've probably had almost close to a thousand people right now in this call just with us as we've been rocking and rolling. If you go share it with 10 people, that helps us get the message to 10,000 people so that we can help them also bring the heat. And, and when you share it, tag them and tell them to text heat to 40649 so we can get them rocking and rolling. And lastly, for more info and resources, we are constantly working on bringtheheat.info on the site. We're working on it. We're getting it up and running. There are going to be more resources that enable you to up your game around what has happened and then be able to move into action. If you go to bringtheheat.info, I want to encourage you to go to the resources tab. You can go back and watch some of our, our, our videos from some of the old heat symposiums. Listen to some of the loved ones from Ferguson. Starting next week, we're going to take these Zoom calls, these town halls, and we're going to put those on the website so that people can catch up who haven't joined in. Next week, we are going to be talking about equipment. We got a dope, powerful sister, Tamika Mallory from New York. Y'all saw that dope video that went viral. Tamika was in Minneapolis telling them what it is. Our sister is full of fire. We're going to have Tamika Mallory here in the virtual town hall next week so that we can talk about how we demilitarize and, and bring a strong critique around defunding the police and really creating something that works for all of us. So make sure you tap in. Pastor Mike McBride, my brother, will be back. We'll get Sister Tamika Mallory, and we might have one more surprise guest that's not confirmed yet, but we will let you know. Tomorrow, we are going to have an email coming out to you with some notes from today's town hall and with some links and information that you can engage and tap in with. Listen, y'all, I wanna thank y'all for hanging. It's been about 75 minutes. It's the end of the day. If you're on the East Coast, it's time to go get you uh, something to eat and maybe a libation for those uh, who practice, amen. Go ahead and enjoy your evening. This is the work that we must do. This is not a sprint. Shout out to Nipsey. This is a marathon. We gotta do this work. And so let us close 
with the words of our sister Asada Shakur. I like to call it in my faith tradition, I have named this quote from her, the litany of prophetic resistance. So repeat after me, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Say it again, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you for joining town hall number two of six. We talked about the H is for hiring. Next week, we'll be back to talk about the E for equipment. Find me on Tuesday, Instagram, Ben J. McBride for The Daily Fight. Join in, let's be a part of that conversation. More resources. Share this out with your friends on Facebook. Let's bring the heat until all of us in this society can live free. Love y'all. Peace. We'll see you next week.